Good evening and welcome to the University of Chicago, Francis and Rose Yuen campus in Hong Kong for our seventh and final episode in Global Conversation live online event, 100 Year Lives in Asia with Professor Kate Cagney. My name is Mark Barnico and I'm the Executive Director of the University of Chicago, Francis and Rose Yuen campus in Hong Kong. We're again broadcasting tonight's event via Zoom, Facebook and YouTube Live from the Hong Kong Jockey Club Academic Complex on the U Chicago UN campus. If audience members have questions for any of the panelists, you can submit them through the question and answers button by first registering on Zoom. Once again, I'd like to remind everyone, the UN campus in Hong Kong is the University of Chicago's premier location in Asia, which represents our U Chicago values of free and open discourse, rigorous debate, and the exchange of ideas. I encourage you to visit our website at www.uchicago.hk for news and information on the latest events hosted by the U Chicago UN campus, or follow us on the U Chicago UN campus Facebook page. The 100 Year Lives in Asia series is one of the new programs developed and produced under the UN Lecture Series banner by Professor Kate Cagney and the U Chicago UN campus team. As our 100 Year Lives in Asia series concludes this evening, I want to remind you we'll begin our next UN lecture series entitled The US Presidential Election with U Chicago political science professor William Howell on September 10th. Tonight, we're again delighted to welcome Professor Kate Cagney from the University of Chicago's sociology department to host this seventh and final episode. This evening, Professor Cagney will discuss where we go from here innovation and opportunities with an expert panel joining the discussion. During the 100 Year Lives in Asia series, we've worked to help listeners understand the arc of a human life, which with advances in medicine and longer life expectancy may have many more years than we ever imagined. What that means in simple terms is the structure of education, of career, of family, of finances and of support networks may need to be rethought and in many cases re-engineered by individuals, families, institutions, and government policy makers. Longer lives mean we have more time to pursue broader interests or pursue those interests more deeply. Living to 100 means we may have time and resources to give back to society. It may also mean we'll have more than one partner or we may live in solitude for many more years than we expected. Living 100 year lives means we may enter a care home, be incapacitated or have in, in home care. And as many of us look toward longer lives, will our resources be sufficient? And will our governments provide a safety net if our resources run out? All of these scenarios translate to new opportunities for entrepreneurs with exciting innovations in technology, services or creative new business models. Those may manifest themselves in for-profit or not-for-profit businesses. As with any investment in new sectors, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, social enterprises, and corporate innovation labs must do their homework and understand what the market and people in this changing demographic need. To celebrate the completion of the 100 Year Lives in Asia series, next week we'll hold a special event at 8.30 p.m. Thursday. August 6th, to thank all of our panelists and everyone who's participated in our program as audience members. We also plan to invite the dozens of people who've been behind the scenes to help conceive, promote, and execute this important series. You'll receive an email from us in the coming days with a personal invitation to this unique thank you event where you'll have direct access to Professor Cagney and other past panelists. And please don't forget, you can find prior episodes of our 100 Year Lives in Asia programs on our uchicago.hk website and on our new YouTube channel. Now, for the last time in this episode series, this seven episode series, I'd like to invite Kate to the screen and introduce the chair of 100 Year Lives in Asia, Kate Cagney. Professor Cagney is a professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago and the Director of Population Research Center, NORC, and the University of Chicago. Kate, I speak for all of us on the UN campus when I say 
Thank you so much for taking us on this special journey during these unique and difficult times. We all truly appreciate your expertise and partnership with our UN campus team to develop such an important series for our audiences from around the world. I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Mark. And thanks to all UN campus for facilitating our conversations and for bringing us together during this very important time. I think we've both learned a lot and um, have gained so much in terms of our knowledge related to this arc of our lives. And I also wanna take a moment to thank all of those at the UN campus um, and, and to encourage you to participate next week, August 6th. Uh, and as Mark noted, um, we spent our time together thinking about the arc of these lives, our own through the life course and relationships among generations as we move forward. We focused on social relationships, health, expectations, and responsibilities across generations, and the role of government policy and social safety nets. So where do we go from here? We're gonna think today about innovation, about what might drive it, and about social entrepreneurship and aging as opportunity. So really recasting how we're thinking about this global change in age structure. So let me tell you about the experts who will guide our conversation today. First, Ai Sakata is an expert in the silver economy and gerontology and research on aging more broadly. Ms. Sakata works in a major think tank in Japan and consults with clients, including Japanese national government agencies and local governments and private companies. She examines the notion of the silver economy and she'll define that for us and explain more about what she means. Um, aging businesses and gerontology more broadly and compares policies, trends and practices in a global context. Ms. Sakata presents her work on aging related topics, both in Japan and in France. She has a master's degree in gerontology from King's College London, University of London. Next, my colleague Rob Gertner is the Joel F. Gamunder Professor of Strategy and Finance at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, where he's also the John Edwardson Faculty Director of the Rustandi Center for Social Sector Innovation. Gertner has been on the Chicago Booth faculty since 1986. He was a Deputy Dean at Booth from 2012 to 2017. His research interests include social innovation, strategic decision-making, organization economics, and social enterprises. He has published papers in numerous scholarly journals and is co-author of the book, Game Theory and the Law. Gertner teaches courses in strategic decision-making, impact investing, and social entrepreneurship, including the course that supports the John Edwardson Social New Venture, U Chicago's Accelerator for Student-Led Social Ventures. He is chair of the NORC at the University of Chicago Board of Trustees for Social Survey Organization and is a life trustee of the Interfaith Youth Corps. Finally, Professor Erwin Wong is a serial entrepreneur, I love that definition, a leader in social enterprise and in the, in the in e-learning the e field for more than 30 years. Currently, he is associate professor and senior advisor of the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. His mission is to teach social innovation and entrepreneurship to university students and to let more young people understand the entrepreneurial spirit, identify social issues, as well as create social impact through innovations. He's a vice chairman of Junior Achievement Hong Kong, co-founder of Dream Starter, and chairman of the Virtual Reality Educate Limited Consultant Group, which fosters the interest in schools and enhances virtual reality e-learning. He's also founder of Agent of Change, and chairman of Social Career, a nonprofit organization that educates the general public about volunteerism and involvement in social causes and services. So I'm so pleased to have this panel with us today to celebrate um, the end of this very enriching series. And I'm gonna ask Erwin now to uh, start us off. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank yeah? you. Okay. So so uh, uh, let's share this, uh, my, my, I, I, I only have one slide. And there's a very simple concept uh, from, the, uh, from, from, from the book, uh, from uh, the, the 100 Year Life uh, from, from Linda Gritton. Uh, and uh, this actually is a very interesting uh, way to actually put it. It actually doesn't come from the book. It actually comes from a, the Japanese version of the book, which when doing my research, I actually come through it. And some of the ideas is actually very much uh, related to, especially to the to the Asian 
uh, situation. So, so I'll, I'll bring that up a little bit. So the whole concept here, if we, if we look at this chart, uh, the, in, on the left, on, on the right side, you start seeing that the age, obviously that this is a hundred year old concept. So on the right side, you will see that uh, there's a, that in Japan, the, uh, the life expectancy is getting up to the 85, 86 area. It depends on the uh, female, or, uh, male or female. And also for the for Hong Kong people, actually we are about about the same up, up, up there. So in Taiwan, Singapore, a lot of the Chinese and Asian communities, we start seeing that this uh, life expectancy really go up. Obviously, that that has to do with uh, with the uh, better medical and and and, and well being uh, systems, better insurance system in the developed economies and so on. So so that's that's how we are seeing that. Uh, but 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 obviously, when at first when we look into the look, look, look into it, people live longer, but does that does that mean they become a burden to the society? And one of the interesting argument in this book is actually uh, uh, it's actually that they they use the idea where in Asia or in the world we start seeing this in the younger age. Uh, there's there's this a new new uh, uh, attention or a, a focus on 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 the future of work. Which is related to what 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 in the U.S. called slashy. The word slash actually comes from Lincoln, where where everybody is. You have a job. I have. A, I'm a professor, but I'm also a father. I'm also a guitarist. I'm also an IG shop uh, owner and so on. So many many people start taking up all kinds of jobs, uh, and not just having a very long one 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 job career, and, and they basically take up many different things at the same time. And that's very, very common, especially for the younger generation, for the millennials and so on. So in the middle of this chart, you start seeing that uh, the people start take, taking up different jobs, uh, jobs become shorter, and also they take up different things and so on. So as, as Katie mentioned, one of our, one of, one of our startup uh, here, it's, it's a data-driven uh, volunteering system, uh, one of the largest in Asia. It's actually basically it's an, an app, it's called Social Career. The idea actually come from Pete, uh, Peter Drucker where he coined the word a parallel career when people are starting to retire. So, so social career actually comes from the idea that, that everybody can, can have different um, multiple career. One is, one is obviously your business, your, 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 the work that you actually do, your profession. The other, it's something that might be related to the, to, to the things that you care about. Your, the social career in that sense, the parallel career that you actually start looking, to, looking into. For the millennial, this is very common. They care about the society a lot more uh, they are more educated and so on, especially in the developed world. So we start seeing that they are actually, instead of just taking one job, they are actually uh, involved in many, many different things. And some are jobs, some are career related, but also some are social impact related. So, so that's something that we start seeing. And, and through the cycle, we also see that people, these people are actually getting to be explorer. They are, they are looking into new, new uh, career, new industries, uh, tra they travel a lot more. And also, uh, and also, they are they are they're interested to disc to discover things. Okay, the third one is actually independent producer. So 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 they start taking up job as a profession. So they start taking things and so on. This 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 we all understand as a slash of career that 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 has been uh, uh, booming in the last ten years or so, especially for the millennial. But uh, in in the book, especially in Japan and in, in Asia, we start seeing that this circle of being a, an explorer, being a slash worker, and being independent producer, it's actually starting to actually happen for people around their uh, retirement age. So, so people might be, instead of, let's say in Japan, the re retirement age is 65, and they're talking about getting it to 70, because the, the workforce is, uh, the demography actually go, goes like a reverse pyramid. So more and more old, older people are up there. So most, in most of the economies, uh, the, the developed ones, uh, after the baby boomers start retiring, there are more and more people, uh, there are less and less uh, people in the workforce. So people keep on working in the workforce. So they can't push, up, push back the retirement age. But another way to see it, it's people, let's say when they're getting into the 50s, they start actually taking up more than one job or getting out of their full-time role to actually start taking new things. And there are a few things that, that this particular concept actually mentioned, that it's very important that most, most of them, these are, these are well, more, more educated, uh, uh, health conscious people, uh, affluent with overall technologies and smart technologies and so on. Uh, and, they, and they care about their, their own career a lot more uh, and also care about their health a lot more. So, so they are, and usually, usually they might have a family so they can, either one of them can actually take the role to actually start, uh, start, start 
getting a slash career in a sense. But, and, and also they are very strong in their so-called uh, intangible asset. Here it actually mentioned that they have skills and knowledge in particular industries and they, are, and they can actually, and they have a much more balance of, of life. Uh, most uh, mo mo uh, both mentally and health and, and health wise, and also they have very strong uh, human network, which is which allowed them to actually start moving on to new things. So this actually is a very interesting opportunity that we see: healthy people, technology aware, conscious of health, and they are looking into starting something new. And so, so this kind of serial social entrepreneur type thing. Is actually getting more and more interested here. We start seeing more and more people getting getting into their early fifties. They start actually taking a part time role in their in some of their career and actually start something completely new, which might be a social enterprise, which might be a new a new an actually completely new entrepreneurial uh, startup, or or they actually start taking up an NGO type work and so on. So those are things that we are starting to see, and that means that a lot of opportunity both in the sense of a healthy workforce. And also, uh, they have, and also they have money. They have resource. They have network, and also they have skills. And all these are things that that potentially they can build in. And this is something that we are seeing. I think in Hong Kong, Singapore, in the last uh, five years uh, on, moving on, we will start seeing a lot of people of these uh, uh, middle class plus people that are able to actually start moving into the next next part of their career, which might be completely something new. And and hopefully they would not be sitting back and re and in the retirement role. Where they just they just take money from their saving to actually spend, they are actually generating more value, some of it, and so on. So that's the background. I would like to lay this out as a background. I'd like to pass it back to Katie. Thank you, Erwin. Um, uh, that really set the stage so effectively for um, our broader conversation. I really love this idea of recurring cycles and the serial social entrepreneur, and it's what stage at the life course people might enter that pathway. So. I also want to invite Robert Gertner <laughs> to comment on that too and share a bit about his own work. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for asking me to participate. Um, I'm, I teach social entrepreneurship, so I'm going to take sort of a, that, that focus in my discussion. Can we have my slides? Yes, thank you. So I think one thing, just in thinking about innovation generally, I think it's really important to note that there's a tendency to equate innovation with new scientific knowledge, which is of course an important part of innovation, but isn't that at all. So you know, examples which fit that mold are things like the, uh, the iPhone, where we see that technology, new technology is built right into a product or service. But there are lots of companies that we think of as being innovative, who, um, where what they really do, the key innovations are often not um, developing new technology themselves. So Netflix, we tend to think of as being a technology company, but really what got it off the ground and made it successful to a great extent was the fact that it had created this innovative business model for, um, renting CDs and having a subscription account and getting them by mail. That's what got Netflix going. And that really was taking the power of the internet uh, and CD technology, which allows things to be put into the mail and building a business around it. Similarly, when we think about the early days of Amazon, Amazon really, again, although we think of it as an innovative company and a technology company, the Really, it was taking advantage of technology that was developed elsewhere. It's really taking the internet and thinking about what can we do and how can we create what, that, what was originally a bookstore uh, online, which is better than existing, existing bookstores. And Jeff Bezos actually testified before Congress yesterday and was telling the story of, of Amazon and said when he was first trying to raise a million dollars, the most common question he had in meetings was, what is the internet? Um, and finally, uh, a sort of a broad category of innovation comes around, not so much sometimes using new technology, but not necessarily, but taking advantage of changing preferences, changing demographics, changing insights into the way people behave, 
or issues associated with social problems in institutions. And I use an example here, uh, Impossible Meat, which is a meat substitute company. It actually is a company that fits very much into the first category because it is developing really cutting edge technology for creating uh, vegetable based, based meat that tastes and behaves like um, just like meat. But really, right, the opportunity for that business comes about because of people's changing preferences with respect to the environment and to health. So I think when we think about this in the context of an aging population, I think what, one thing we see is that sort of that innovation often is built around market incentives. And what we see sometimes is that that skews innovation across different types of social issues, social problems and opportunities. I'd like to sort of describe this with showing the contrast, the simple contrast between diabetes and loneliness. So although it's a little harder, right, it's, it's a little harder to, to figure out exactly what the prevalence of loneliness and social isolation is among the elderly, but most measures put it to have sort of similar pre prevalence as diabetes. Um, we all know about the consequences of diabetes. It's well studied and we know they're huge. But it's interesting that loneliness turns out to be associated with, again, same kind of order of magnitude um, health issues. Right? Being lonely is sort of equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes per day on your effect on health. It has greater health consequences than obesity does. And you think about this, if you think about the resources that we as society spend on these two problems and the extent to which there's innovation around them, um, there are enormous differences, right? So even in the sort of nonprofit sector, there are several nonprofits in the United States over a hundred million dollars that are focused on diabetes. There probably aren't many or any uh, um, nearly that size focused on loneliness, the extent of medical research associated with problems of loneliness and the extent of innovation as pointed by new monitoring technology for diabetes uh, technological innovation is much, much greater for diabetes than it is for life. So I think one thing to think about, one of the reasons for this discrepancy, certainly not the only one, is that market forces generate pretty strong incentives for some innovations and not others, right? When we think about sort of the standard entrepreneur's approach, it's how can I solve someone's problem when that someone will also pay for the solution, right? And sometimes that creates some disconnect between the value that an innovation can create uh, and, um, and what people focus on the profit opportunity. Those include things like intellectual property protection, whether it's there or not, how strong it is, regulatory systems, um, what do health insurance programs pay for, what do they not pay for. I think that's a big source of the difference between why there's innovation for diabetes and less for loneliness. And sometimes those who really benefit, those whose problems you're solving, may not be in a position to pay. I have an example here, but I think for the basis of time, I'll, I'll, hopefully I'll get, be able to talk about it during the, during, the, um, during the discussion, but I will hold off. I think it's useful to think about that sort of the social entrepreneur, although their businesses may look very much the same as traditional ventures, Social innovation is really built around a different motivation, where rather than starting with uh, someone's problem and who can pay for a solution, you really start with a problem, a social problem, and then try to figure out when you think about what an innovative solution might be, is there a business model and what is the business model to create that innovation? And that sometimes leads to for-profit businesses, sometimes it leads to Nonprofits with a sustainable business model that could lead to philanthropy based nonprofits, advocacy or organizations, new government policies or programs, sort of all sorts of different ways to make an innovation focused on a social problem a reality in the world. So I think I thought I would try to think about uh, come up with a problem associated with aging that I think is underexplored, probably because sort of figuring out the money-making venture associated with innovation here is a bit challenging. So this is actually similar to some of the things Erwin talked about, but one of the things with aging is that people's retirement age 
can be very different. And retiring at 80 versus 60 is a difference of more than 50% of most people's sort of participation in the work, workforce. And I think what's interesting about retirement choice is that um, when you're 40, 50, maybe even 60, you may not know whether you'll want to retire at 60 or at 80, right? Your future health status is uncertain. I think it's hard to predict what your preferences about future work are going to be. Okay. This is coupled certainly in the United States and other places with a shift from defined benefit retirement savings to defined contribution plans. So what that means is that you can have, whether you retire at 60 and continue and sort of start drawing down from your, from your retirement savings, or you work till 80 and you continue to earn on the existing savings you have, plus add to it and not draw down upon it, can create enormous differences in the wealth someone has at retirement. Um, so that creates a number of interesting challenges. First, how do we create opportunities for meaningful productive work past the standard retirement age? Um, and Erwin talked a little bit about these things. And I think, you know, one, one great thing is to say, I'm going to quit my job and become a social entrepreneur. But I think we need to think about innovation that creates a broader set of career paths for people um, once they're 60 or so. Um, and, you know, they include part-time work. As a, as a university professor, um, without going into detail, sort of some of this is built into the nature of the job. So I, I'm in a position where it's really fortunate that what I do and what my job looks like as, as one gets older can shift in a way that allows one and allows many of my colleagues to be productive well past standard retirement age. And then we have this sort of interesting opportunity about thinking about whether or not we can create product savings insurance financial products to deal with this enormous uncertainty people face about sort of what their needs are going to be in retirement as a function of when they choose uh, when they choose to retire in retirement time so I think you know I think it's this is really an exciting place for and sort of this aging population for all types of innovation, technological innovations, but also I think um, uh, social entrepreneurship that ends up being a little more focused on addressing the problems with business models that may sometimes not be as obviously profitable. And uh, I look forward to talking more about these during our conversation. Great, thank you, Robin, for that framing around innovation and thinking about issues like updated preferences. And I really wanna get back to loneliness, um, especially in this historic moment, we could think about really important interventions related um, to that circumstance. So with that, let me um, bring in Isagata to share her work. Hi, hello, thank you for inviting me to be here, I'm so pleased. Um, so my name is Ai Sakata. I work as a consultant in Japanese think tank. Since I was grown up in a house where four generations live together, it is natural for me to be interested in aging and still pursue this theme in my, in my work. Today I'd like to talk about innovations and opportunities for 100 year lives in Japan from two perspectives which are older people as new market customers and older people as new workforce. So let's start, begin with the first one. The idea of putting older people as new market targets can be called silver economy, longevity economy, or aging business. And in my opinion, the keyword in here should be Jadon technology. Japanese company used to develop technologies for losing burden of care workers such as power suits, automatic beds, because that kind of product are in the launch of care insurance. However, these days some of them focus on developing product for older people themselves, especially the product which makes them keep living independently, such as AI speakers or automatic wheelchairs. And among these products, I personally think communication robots will be the key product. The main purpose of this product should be getting rid of the loneliness and many studies already declare that they are very effective, especially for older, older, older adults who live alone. Rather than that, through the robot, they can 
call a taxi or Uber to hospital. They can do shopping if the robot talks to them like, hey, your face wash is out of stock. Why don't you get one? And they can order food delivery by their voice. And robot may suggest their vacation or leisure plans. So through the channel, numbers of industries can reach to older people, I think. Although the needs of older people are quite various and it's already too small for big companies to develop one single product or service, so now is the time to think new business by uh, connecting products and services. Another opportunity for 100 year lives is to think older people as new workforce. Retirement age in Japan is used to be 60, However, now it's mandatory for Japanese companies to hire employees until they reach 65. In Japan, people can get pension from 60 years, 65 years old, but for people who want to work longer, they can get it later and more. Japanese people want to work as long as possible. They have anxiety for the future, especially how much money they need for their longer life. But what do young people think about working with older ones? Our research team surveyed almost 2,000, 2000 people about their attitude to working with over 65 years old. We asked them the question, with who do you prefer to work? Older people, AI, including robots, foreigners, or consultants. And it turned out that more people reported either being pleased to work with older people or ready to work them with under certain conditions to compare to other choices. To encourage older people to keep on working, in here also, I think technology will play a major role. I'd like to share one interesting example of older workers in Tokushima, which is South part of Japan. It's called Leaf Business. If you have been to traditional Japanese restaurants, you, may, you might have seen the dishes decorate with small leaves like this. And one company tried to develop a platform between restaurants and other farmers who produce the leaves and distributed tablet, which are simplified for other people to use. With the devices, now older, older farmers input the number of leaves they can sell and make the contact with restaurants by all by themselves. This platform has contract with 190 farmers, many of them in their 70s, now post 260 million yen in annual sales. However, matching system between older people and companies are not yet well prepared in Japan, especially for white collars. So in summary, Japan is a leading Asian country, but it doesn't mean that we are well prepared for everything. If you look around the world, for example, in the UK, the position of the Ministry of Loneliness was announced two years ago. And in France, the government supports the startups who produce products for elderly by offering the office in the suburbs of Paris, and it's called Silver Valley, just like a Silicon Valley in the US. In South Korea, in Seoul, local government organized disco event for over 65 years old by aiming to tackle loneliness and dementia. So there are several interesting efforts and developments depending on each culture, so we keep watching what other countries do, and we can share good ideas or challenge each other. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, that a great overview and also very helpful because you brought in insights from a lot of different cultures. And since you just mentioned the Ministry of Loneliness, I wanted to ask Rob um, about his reactions to that. Would that be something um, that we could mount in the United States? Um, could we have mounted on local levels? I was just interested in your reaction since you had mentioned loneliness. Yeah, no, I think, I think it would be uh, wonderful. Uh, I think that um, it certainly is uh, a problem that has received way too little attention. And I think there certainly are roles for government. I think there's a lot of opportunity for, you know, I think almost more excited about, about the idea of, uh, of uh, um, Silicon Valley for 
for for this because I think actually a lot of the a lot of the more likely solutions I feel you know I don't feel about this all the time uh, are going to come from private sector initiatives rather than um, government, but government supporting those things would be great. I understand that in in UK they actually have a have a minister of loneliness or something like that. Is that is that they actually create that role? Yeah, it has a lot more focus in the UK. When you start looking looking at, um, there are also some big nonprofits with government support um, in the UK. It, it's gotten a lot more attention there than it has um, in the United States, and I'm not entirely sure why that's the case. And Erwin, um, what what are your reactions to the Silicon Valley comment? And <laughs> thinking whether they're <laughs> that's actually. Here. Yeah. Yes, that's actually uh, uh, it makes a lot of sense. I've never thought of it that way, but uh, yeah. it makes a lot of sense because the, the uh, old being old doesn't mean you are really out of action. You are you have network, and it's much easier. See, for the last five years, ten years, I, what I've been doing in the, being a lot latter part of my life, being a slash myself, is that uh, instead of starting new companies, I help younger people start their companies. Mm -hmm. So so let's say, frankly, to start a real startup, you need to be really fluent with some of the technologies or some of the, and you should work 150% of your time. You don't sleep. That's like 20 to 35 year old, something like that. And then that definitely, and, and people at my age, we, we sleep, and but we help you contact and connect with the right network and, and build the infrastructure, let's say, to, to know the right people, to understand the new system, the system that might work. And then working together, that might actually work. So, so I think I think the key is actually uh, when you get older, you start appreciating that there are things that other people are doing better than you. Uh, but there there are things that to you it's very easy. You just make a call, the right call, get the things going, and then you're you're, you're sitting there with a bank. Your your introduction is much important, much more important than a young person. So those might be might be some difference that we can see. But a young person, they are they are able to take much much tougher risk. They work hard, much harder during, 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 let's say they don't sleep in a way. So, mm -hmm. so, 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 so those are things that I see. And some kind of this getting together thing would actually be very, very interesting. And again, Silicon Valley, it's all about network, about new, new innovation being driven and so on. And being, having funding, having deal flow around those and so on. And I think those are very, very important. And instead of looking at this as a, uh, a failed sector, that we need insurance to actually look after it. We need it's all about medical insurance and a failed uh, old economy type thing. So, so I think that's something completely new, and that not that marketing message is actually very good. Yeah, I th I think I mean I, one of the, I think one of the challenges is that entrepreneurs often are somewhat introspective in the sense that they're trying to solve their problems and problems of people like them. And I think there's a fair amount of subtlety to some of these problems that the elderly face where, you know, introspection won't be enough. And I think sort of, I, I kind of see sort of an ecosystem developing, which really starts to develop an understanding of sort of what actually works as a solution. So for example, right, to take loneliness again, um, I once gave an assignment for my students to come up with, this, you know, in class, so really quickly, sort of innovative solutions for loneliness. I didn't say it had to be on the elderly, but sort of, you know, every, you know, the vast majority were sort of apps for connecting people, right? And it just felt like they were thinking about the problem through their own lens. And, you know, if you know about loneliness, it's not really, it's more about an internal feeling. It's not even necessarily about whether you actually interact with other people and trying to deal with that is a lot more subtle. And I think the fact that the students weren't in a position to introspect about that sort of made them miss the opportunity. So I think sort of the age divide between uh, who, who our entrepreneurs tend to be and who the, who the beneficiaries are, I think creates an interesting challenge that I think sort of, you know, we need some, we need some activity, more activity in this space so that people start being more aware and knowing what kinds of solutions work. Well, I thought um, uh, your own example about growing up in a multi-generational household 
really having been embedded in that space, certainly, as you suggest, shaped your research interests. But it might make you, right, of course, um, more knowledgeable about the kinds of things that could be effective. So I was interested in, in your comments on that and also um, those data you shared about people's readiness to work with those of other generations. I mean, that, that relates well to Erwin's point about thinking, you know, what can generations in some sense do for one another? What are the unique skills and insights they bring? Yes, as I showed in my presentation in Japan, most of them are um, not hesitate to work with older people. It's maybe because uh, we are not get used to work with foreigners, but still we need older people's knowledge, know-how, experiences. But the third point is um, we still don't know how to match the older people's knowledge and what the needs of companies. There are some platforms, but it doesn't work well yet. So, um, and the salary system is not good too. So it's very um, difficult for Japanese company to keep much the motivation bo both of older people and young people, I think. I do There's think a, that yeah. sort of one of the advantages of the, one of the silver linings perhaps of the pandemic is the, is sort of the, the flexible work environments and the working from home and trying to think about, you know, how well that has worked and sort of that creates a number of opportunities for certainly uh, people who are uh, disabled, both elderly and not. So I think that's an interesting thing. I think it's also, it's, it's interesting to think about the analog, which has been sort of the attempt to redesign work for uh, parents who are trying to you know, sort of uh, be deeply involved with raising their children and also uh, also have, uh, you know, uh, high, highly challenging professions. And I think that um, I would say we as a, you know, as, as a society haven't done a great job and it's been a, it's been a long, hard process. And I think sort of, you know, hopefully as we start focusing more on, on seniors and how to, how to sort of redesign work around the constraints and the opportunities, we do a better job than we've done so far with, uh, with matching careers in parenthood. Yeah. That's an excellent point because all require, right, engagement and caregiving and how do we accommodate that effectively? Erwin, you were gonna jump in. Yes, I have an interesting experience. I, I was sitting on the board of a very large uh, NGO in Hong Kong I think they have five five thousand employees or something like that. So so serving two hundred sites, and we were actually in the in the board. Uh, I think last year, and the CEO, the CEO of the of this NGO, bring out a problem, because of the as I mentioned the reverse pyramid, people the people are leaving the workforce and the uh, and the and they're leaving it with knowledge, with uh, with contextual knowledge that understand. Let's say in the elderly home or let's say in the in the in the uh, in the in the different services that they, they, they offer, these people are actually retiring. So so they have ten they bring they bring with them 10, 20 years of experience and leaving the leaving the, the workforce. And the, the younger generation they, they jump job too much. So every nobody worked for five years in the place. So 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 basically they work for two years, they jump onto the next thing. So that's why it's very hard to actually retain some of the some of the knowledge and the skills that that was actually in the in the in the in the society, and in, in this NGO particularly. So 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 they were they, they, so she's bringing up this discussion. Is there a way that we can keep these people? Because mm -hmm. it, for the NGO, they have this sixty-year-old thing. So one day out at your at, at your 60, 61 or sixties uh, birthday, you need to retire. So but supposedly you, you are still very healthy, but it's just 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 one day you suddenly move into a new place. Which is supposedly you start you start uh, counting down, or you start uh, you start you you have you're saving you start getting get, uh, getting instead of earning to your saving, as Robert had mentioned, you're actually taking out things from there. That's a very strange feeling, and also uh, ob obviously they might retire with a package. Then maybe they go on a cruise, but how many cruises can you actually do? So 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 it's actually not not too good. So so I was I was actually in, the, in this discussion. It's a very interesting this discussion. This CEO and herself is actually 58. 
So it's about time she start thinking about successions also. So almost everybody in that entity, I think that's a good reflection of her overall overall situation at least in our cities. So so okay. So one interesting uh, solution that comes up yeah. uh, is is that uh, I, I I throw the idea that let's say let's say after fifties. I can uh, let's say I'm an employee. I can or I can take a fifty percent salary cut and work three days a week. We work five days, so 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 I give you a little bit more. So so I take fifty percent off, but uh, but I get forty uh, percent of free time. So it's a very interesting word free, because at that point, that let's say fifty five or fifty some, you're still young in the sense of you still have energy to exercise something new, and it's every long, every weekend is a long weekend. So, so I can go off for Thursday and then I come back Tuesday and then, uh, and, uh, but I still have work to do. So, it, but instead of doing your day-to-day, -day, uh, let's say management role, looking at numbers, chasing KPIs and doing hard work type thing, you become some kind of a knowledge hub that you can start passing on to people. So, so from cleaning up beds to actually the CE, we, we have a chance to actually start looking at the process. But, at the age of 60, you don't have to retire. So you can work as long as you want. So that, that project turns out, we, we were starting in some of the project in this particular NGO, turns out that we, we, the, the, the HR department and, and, the, and the board actually decide that you can work as long as you want. And, 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 but you take salary cut in a sense to buy your freedom. So at some point you do one day a week, but that's really good because then you're not lonely. You have something to go back to every week. And then, uh, but you are, but there's no pressure in that sense. But, but, but also your knowledge is always there, especially when you are high level meta and thing, but you're passing it to other people, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you'll be able to actually work on it. And those are things that, that we can, that we see that might be something that would be, that's good. So turns out they start working on the system that people get to into their second job in a way, but well protected. By the by, the first job by taking fifty percent, forty percent, wherever over time. But then you're contributing to your to your savings, and you can save ten more years. But you still have insurance. You still have uh, you can still work one day or two day depends on how you work like that. So that's a very interesting way that the whole model works. It's it's all legal because the, the the government doesn't force you to actually retire on sixty. Most of them is a company type thing. So those are things that's really worth thinking. Uh, and at some level these kinds of potential. But at first, when we first bring it out, every, everything, everybody was thinking, this is crazy. Why would I take salary cut, right? <laughs> but but uh, it's a completely different. It's actually you're earning some kind of freedom through that. So that's a very interesting thing, yeah. That's a terrific example because it's really sort of not treating uh, retirement as this kind of, you know, bifurcated state <laughs> from employment, yeah. right? One eases out of it and engages in adaptive responses to it. Um, I, I was inter I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Um, do you have examples too, where people are kind of um, still adhere to their primary profession, the one in which they were trained during midlife and uh, but, but can sort of continue to participate as they'd like? Um, okay, so maybe in the future there will be no template or model of uh, like study, work, retire model mm -hmm. and people will work when they need or they want to and they stop to work in order to get new skills in the university or wherever and maybe age of giving birth for women would be extended and my dream is to study abroad again when my grandchild want to do so and yeah. I think it would be possible and so although the, um, there, there would be no model it is true that we have more active periods than, than before so we before we don't need to care about too much about the future when we retire so the rest of life would be last so long. However, we will still longer life. So it's essential to prepare not only money, but also knowledge, skills to compete with another ones. So there are um, some universities open for older people in Japan and also younger ones. And they are um, after that 100 year, year, year lives books uh, published, the, think the way of thinking for Japanese is a bit changed. Normally we stuck in one company and current older people have 
maybe some people have no experience to even write CV because they have no experience to change the company. So it's now I think it's important to define and make it clear what they can do, what the skill the older people or younger people have and exchange the needs and the skills too much. But it's still under development now. And Rob, I want to shift a little bit and think about this notion of innovation and you raised it. We have a question from a listener that who, who asks, um, is innovation in the space very localized due to specific environments? And I think that's a great question. Or do we see it more as a global phenomenon? Uh, how do we? How do yeah, we think I think there's a fair amount of both. I think, you know, certainly sort of like some of the technology I and Erwin were talking about are technologies that sort of apply globally. So things, you know, like, you know, for balance or right, et cetera, you know, uh, so those sorts of things. But I do think there are aspects, right, that are fairly local. And I think, right, so certainly sort of the, the bizarre sort of healthcare system that we have in the United States where, you know, what's paid for by whom is so, you know, it's kind yeah. of so crazy that creates, you know, opportunities uh, and I think constraints on innovation in a way like who's mm -hmm. going to pay for it and how, right, mm -hmm. that I think will vary a fair amount locally. And I do think, I mean, I do think, you know, with a lot of social innovation, what we've learned is that, you know, context matters a lot and what's effective, right? So sort of family structure and, you know, whether or not children and grandchildren are local or not local, all of those sort of will affect what are the best opportunities. So, you know, I, there's lots of innovation opportunities about, you know, kind of, you know, helping um, children and grandchildren take care of parents and grandparents who are far away. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's something which might be more common in the U.S. and common for, you know, for the younger generations of, of immigrants, various places than it is in societies where, where people are more local and family structures are such. So I think, I think it's a, it's a real mix. Mm -hmm. There are some some very interesting uh, product that that I that I, I think there are obviously there are local especially uh, policy related insurance related things that that especially related to healthcare or medical and there are and there are medicine or there are healthcare uh, 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 herbs like medicines and so on but that's the normal way to think about it. but I I really like uh, some Japanese product let's say Nintendo they create the wing. The thing that I, I don't have it here, but it's a, it's a, it's it's a very good thing that actually conquered the world. It's actually because of the pandemic. It's actually so all, all the time. It's a it's a small ring that actually you do the you do all the uh, the, uh, the the uh, the the healthcare type thing with it, I and then yeah, you exercise, yeah, exercise with it and so on. And if you put down what what age you are, it will tune itself so that it will actually show you the the right picture and then encourage you to be safely doing your 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 home home type thing and so on and so there are uh, or the Apple Watch being a very good uh, Christmas present for fa or, or Father's Day present or something like that. Those are things that are actually quite interesting. Where uh, software and hardware wise, uh, consumer pro obviously there are not that many go global consumer product that, that that's very strong. But definitely that's really worth thinking. Why why should why would a elderly person wear a old watch or obviously they want the they want the old classic watch, but but, but at the same time, a, a, a good Apple Watch and some of the products or, or Fitbit would actually fit them well, and uh, and they understand because because let's say uh, my my mother-in-law, uh, we we give her a, uh, a weight a small weight that, that she stands on every day, uh, uh, and, she, and 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 it's very simple. She every every morning when she get up, she she, she stands on it, and then she got a message from her phone telling her, congratulating her that, that she lose a little bit of weight and that she'll be doing, doing well. So almost every day, that's all, that's all she did. So with a good user experience design, this is a, this is a service, it's not just a hardware, there's a service that you continually actually just provide mm -hmm. and, then, and, and so on. So it's a very simple thing that you can actually do and, uh, and these health, health consciousness is, is actually very important. And, and mm -hmm. because of the newer technology that Robert had mentioned, let's say the iPhone type thing, 
uh, a lot of the technology is being shielded. Shield. Let's say the Nintendo wing have so much technology built in, but it's so simple that, mm -hmm. that it actually is actually a very interesting product and it, it can go very far. Mm. Oh, um, I, in the professor, I even talking about the design of the product to other people. And I also think that that is very important these days, especially in Japan, maybe people, other people tend to um, want to save money instead of using the money and mm -hmm. really hesitate to, to buy new product um, which is not familiar to them. And when I was in France to attend the event of Silva Economy, I'm surprised that everything is well designed, not the, not like the product for older people, but for product, product for young people. And in the everything is with vivid colors for decorating the booth or everything. So I think to keep having positive attitude toward aging and keep aging is look um think like cool things is very important especially um for developing new product or services so i can't believe it but we're we're getting so close to the end of our time together but one of the things i know it, 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 oh it goes so quick we should do this for at least an hour and a half. um <laughs> so i um I wanted to shift the focus a little bit. We have a really nice question from a listener acting about adaptive career management as one ages and thinking about how to, how to be mindful, right, of age and aging. And I wanted to, I wanted to talk about that piece, but also um, a bit about economic status. And of course, our hope is that we, uh, we come to this point in the life course and we are able to make choices to sort of ease out of our professions. But, but what do we do if we've, we've come to that point in life and we actually don't have any savings and we don't have those possibilities? And I have a, a colleague in the Harris School, Dimitri Kustis, has been doing a lot of work looking at the gig economy and older adults who are driving Uber and, and making mm -hmm. use of other kinds of mechanisms. So I wondered if you both wanted to comment on, you know, thinking about being attentive to one's career across life and then how that might vary by economic well-being. Well, that's a big question for the last few minutes. Um, <laughs> so, which means that I don't have to have a very good answer, which is good. Uh, I, you know, I think this is one of, you know, this is a really deep fundamental challenge. And I think, you know, I think part of it is, I raised it a little bit. It's, it's really hard to know where you're going to be. Um, you know, when you're 40 to figure out what your position is going to be, what your health is going to be, what your, family situation is going to be, what your preferences are going to be, what the opportunities are going to be when you're, you know, 20, 25 years down the road. But that's when you need to um, be thinking about it. So, I, I mean, I think there are no simple solutions. I think trying to think more creatively about the way our social insurance mechanisms work in this environment, um, I think would be very useful. I think that again, expanding the set of opportunities, right? As Erwin was talking about and I about sort of the types of jobs and the ways in which there's sort of a more robust market for, for job opportunities so that if you have a lot of skills and ability or whatever, you don't have to necessarily take a much lower paying job because that's all that's, all that's available. So, I, you know, I, but beyond that, I think this is one of the, most interesting challenges for both policy and for innov innovators and entrepreneurs. It's it's a big challenge, and uh, I obviously it's so new at the, in this particular area that we might need more research and also contextual uh, uh, thing to look into. But one interesting thing that we do in at the university when people are talking, when our students, our undergrad students, are talking about slashing. Mm -hmm. uh, Normally you're thinking, well, you spend eight years to become a doctor, you said you spend five years to become an architect. So if you slash too much, how can you build your career? That's that's uh, that's a normal way that we older people kind of think. But the but, but the new model that we talk about, I we, I like to use the T model, the T the T model that, that we talk a lot about, which is the the, 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 the character T. There is a straight line to it, and the straight line is over time, even though you are trying many different things, slashing multi, multiple things, you're building something with depth. 
you are building something, let's say well, it, might, it might be connection, it might be skill set, it might be knowledge related to a particular industry or a particular segment. Uh, but this part is actually the explorer part, which I was showing earlier, mm -hmm. that, that you'll be able to actually see the world in a, in a different way. But, but you don't just wander around just like this. Right. You are in a way building your strength over time. Right. <clears throat> Can this be applied to the latter part of, the, of, 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 of life? Likely, I think we need, we should see more a lot a little bit more research on that, because because over time we know we know there are things that we like to do, there are things that we don't touch, there are people that we get 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 to, get, get to deal with, there are people that we don't. So over time, are we building these kinds of network, people, connections, knowledge, industry related things that even when you're retired, people come to you to, to ask you because you own things that other people don't have. So I think that's something that's really worth thinking through. How does we, how do we, we apply that key model to the, to fifties people? That's something that I think we should, we should look into. I like the T model. I do want to comment on that before we close our session. Oh, I also have no good um, answer for this, but um, <laughs> it's difficult to say, but um, like when, um, people, um, if they stop their career and start a new business or new study, um, in Japan, it's easy to be, um, think they are a kind of failure or, um, and maybe want to take a pause, a uh, little bit pause, but, uh, I think we should change the way of thinking and they, now they are trying to get new skills and it's very good opportunity for them. And the but education fee or the uh, the system of new learning new things for young people and also for older people is not uh, well prepared in Japan now yet. So um, for thinking about 100 years 100 year lives, we should change education models and also like um, the connection between education and the job. That's a, that's a great point. And actually we could have a whole additional series in thinking mm -hmm. about how we might approach, right? The educational system differently and when we can enter and exit it. So I will, um, I will suggest that to Mark and colleagues. And, and on that point, I do want to thank um, our wonderful speakers, Isakata, Rob Gertner, Erwin Wong for, for really helping us close this webinar series and to think more, I think, productively and innovatively about what this change in aid structure can mean, um, both at the individual and the population levels. And I also want to give a quick thank you to Chris, Francis, Victor, Kitty, and of course, Mark, for being such wonderful colleagues through this process. I think we've learned so much about how we can come together, even in a moment where we can't engage in face-to-face -face interaction. But I hope someday we'll all be able to meet in Hong Kong and, um, and engage in conference-related <laughs> conversations about many of the themes that you raised today. So I hope um, I will see some of you and some of our listeners next week, August 6th, at the same time where we will ha have an opportunity for more informal exchange and be able to celebrate the close of our webinar series. Thank you so much.